Everyone, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, we're really kind of proud and fortunate to be able to host this event. Um, we have with us this evening an uh, activist, a political activist from the Philippines named Marinel Sumik Ubaldo. Her village was destroyed by a typhoon, and she realized that the underlying source of this was really global warming. And as you've seen all around the world, there's this uh, youth movement about climate change. Um, we're especially appreciative that Amnesty International is co-hosting this, and uh, George Shemkat will be speaking and also um, kind of moderating. So he's going to speak for a few minutes, then she'll talk, and then we'll have an extended Q&A. So don't be shy about that. So I'll pass it on to them. And again, thank you for coming this evening. OK. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. And uh, thanks very much to Temple University for hosting us and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk to you about this uh, very important topic. Um, as Kyle mentioned, so um, first I'm going to do like a quick introduction on Amnesty. Can I ask like how many people know about Amnesty? Can you raise your hand? Wow, so many. That's amazing. OK, I go to a lot of events, universities, and um, usually when I ask this question, um, there are much less people who know about Amnesty. So I'm not going to go much to, into detail then, because I think you're here to listen to Marino's story. Uh, hey, there you go. So um, to just quick, so what do we want at Amnesty? Um, so we are a human rights organization um, with uh, supporters through all, on all corners of the world. Uh, about 7 million people support Amnesty in some form, either as a member or they come to events or they sign a petition. And um, we've been around for 60 years now, uh, almost 60 years. Uh, and uh, in two years, we're going to be 60 years. Um, we're working towards a world where everybody, no matter who, he or she is can uh, enjoy the same rights as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted in 1948, so three years after the World War. And it was drafted because um, until then, human rights were not universal. So what it meant that basically the government could decide what your rights were. Um, so. I'm from Germany, so we have a history of denying people's rights uh, in the Nazi area. For example, the Jewish people were denied any rights, right? even the right to life. Even though they didn't have the right to life. So, uh, same for um, people uh, who were homosexual or, uh, or had like a different political, uh, political opinion. And it was drafted in 1948 to ensure that this tragedy would never happen again. And it was the first time that um, all countries came together. And it was almost like almost 200 countries, so really almost all countries signed on that declaration and wanted to ensure that no matter who you are, where you live, what you believe in, what your sexual orientation is or whatever, that you have the same rights. As you're born as a human being, you should have the same rights. Um, so we're all different, but we should be all equal. Unfortunately. That hasn't been, uh, uh, unfortunately, these, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, was a great vision. But unfortunately, it hasn't been put into practice to 100% yet. Um, and that's why Amnesty is still around. Uh, we're working on um, uh, different topics. Um, our, when we were founded in 61, um, we were mostly working on prisoners of conscience, so there were people who were in, uh, in prison because of their thoughts and their beliefs. Um, it happened to be in um, Portugal in uh, 1960 or 61. There were two students sitting at a bar, and they were just having a toast of freedom. So it was like, cheers to freedom. And they were sent to prison for that, because at that time, uh, Portugal was not a democracy. Um, and um, the leadership didn't like the students um, doing a toast of freedom. And um, the, law the English lawyer, Peter Benison, was so enraged that he put an article um, in, the, uh, uh, in the newspaper calling on to the release of these prisoners. And it became a movement. That's how Amnesty was born. Going forward, we started working on the death penalty, uh, which is still an issue, unfortunately, in Japan, because it still exists. And uh, last year, there were like 13, no, more, 15, 16 executions. And this year, there were like two more. 
Um, unfortunately, we haven't been successful in Japan yet, but if you look at throughout the world, the death penalty is definitely on the decline. There are more and more people who abolish it, uh, more and more countries who abolish it. And then, of course, uh, recently the, the crisis uh, in Syria with the flow of refugees, uh, women's rights, children's rights, and so on. As said, in almost all countries, there's an amnesty supporter. Uh, if you see the colors there, that means that we have an office there. But even in, in Russia uh, or in such countries, there are people who support amnesty uh, in some form. Um, so what makes us, um, I want to use this word special, but what set us, uh, it sets up a part of what's very important uh, um, core idea of amnesty is that we are independent from governments and companies, so we don't take any funds from governments and hardly any funds from companies, uh, only if we're sure they're absolutely clean. And if we hear something, that something happened, and uh, that uh, there were vi human, ri uh, human rights violations uh, where the company was involved, uh, we would definitely quit uh, the relationship with them. Uh, we have our own independent researchers. So what that means, um, when we decide to work on a topic, it's not that we, for example, read the New York Times or the, the Asai Shimbun or something and say, like, oh yeah, it's in there, they must be correct, so let's uh, do some campaign about it. We send our own researchers to the ground. Um, they interview the people on the ground, um, see what actually happens, what the actual human rights violations were, and then publish a, a report and you know, hand it over to the government. Um, yeah, but the biggest powerful amnesty comes from people like you who attend our events, uh, the seven million supporters. Um, you came to our event, so you can count you as an amnesty supporter now if you like. Uh, we'd be more than happy. Um, so what amnesty did since the 60s is uh, that people came together and were uh, writing letters to those prisoners of conscience who were in prison for their thoughts and belief. And um, well, recently uh, we are living in a digital age, so of course we have petitions online. It's very easy if you like to participate, but you don't have so much time or you don't have the funds to donate. For example, you can just come to our, our, our homepage. There's always like three or four petitions that you can easily sign with just leaving your name and clicking the OK button and it goes to the government. And uh, fear not. Um, your voice is absolutely powerful. If you think that just signing an online petition or just writing a letter, why would the government care if you do that, right? I mean, if it's such an easy action, why should they care? But they do, because if it's just not only your voice, they might not, but if it's the voices of like millions of people working towards the same goal, it's absolutely powerful. And Marino is a, actually a part of our Rights for Rights campaign. Um, which we always held around uh, Human Rights Day, so to December 10th. Um, but usually we started around October to um, have like a, a long campaign of about two months uh, uh, leading towards the Human Rights Day. And we always have like 10 cases each year that we're working on. And in average, I would say we get like five or six people, we get good news on them. So what that means, for example, the people who have been in prison, got released, or those people who are under threat from uh, violent threats from government or from other people, um, those threats disappear. And if you look at these people, um, the woman on the right, for example, uh, her name is Idil Iza. She was the director of Amnesty in Turkey, and she was sent to prison um, on the suspicion that Amnesty would be a terror organization. and. Uh, uh, despite there was absolutely no evidence that she did anything wrong, she was in prison for a couple of months, I think half a year or so, until we finally got her out. And for our chairperson, it even took more than a year. Um, but people were writing letters and letters, and uh, this creates attention in the media, right? If, you, if there are so many people speaking up, uh, the media catches up. Uh, the German embassy uh, raises his voice, uh, the Turkish... Uh, uh, organizations in Germany join. And uh, the most, um, well, the case that was I was really proud to be part of is the woman you see in the middle uh, um, giving her uh, relative a hug. She is, uh, her name was Theodore, uh, Ther no, Ther Theodora, uh, from uh, El Salvador. And um, 
So um, 10 years ago, it happened that she was pregnant and she gave, uh, she was about to give birth. She was in a home and unfortunately there were complications and um, the child came out, there was a lot of blood and it turned out it was a stillbirth. So the child was unfortunately dead when it arrived. Um, the police arrived and what did the police? They arrested her. They arrested her saying like, you had an abortion and an abortion is illegal in El Salvador no matter what. So they didn't believe her uh, that it was just a, a stillbirth. Uh, they uh, well, thought or they decided that uh, she had an abortion and uh, the judge sent her to 30 years in prison for that. So not only lo did she lose her child, but she was also sent to prison for 30 years. They totally destroyed her life. And um, Amnesty took over that campaign and we worked on it for 10 years and we finally got her out. So sometimes it takes a long time, but um, when you see these pictures of the women leaving the prison and hugging her family, and you know, it's maybe just one person's life, but um, it's such a powerful moment that you could be part of this. And it's so easy to be part of it. You just join a petition, um, takes you a few seconds, and you might save some people's lives. Um, uh, before I introduce you to Marinel, I just want to introduce you a bit more to our Amnesty volunteer groups, because um, Amnesty is a grassroots organization. So I'm a full-time employee, but um, hey, Marion, so you're just coming at the right moment. Um, I was just about to introduce ITAN, our English-speaking uh, network. So most of our events are actually organized by our volunteer groups. Um, we have about like 10,000 supporters in, in, uh, in Japan, and I'd say that probably 90% of all the events that we do are done by our supporters. Um, there are just uh, 12 people who work full-time in our office, but... Um, and. Uh, yeah, one of the most active groups that we have is called ITIN, which stands for Amnesty um, International Tokyo English Network. So if you go to ITIN.info, you would, for example, see the talk. Uh, I don't know if they ever advertised the talk for today, but the talk that we had like uh, last day in uh, Meiji University, they have a pop quiz uh, every month in Shibuya, if you like to join, and they have uh, other charity events. Um, so definitely drop by and uh, if you're a student you might be interested maybe to have a look at our youth team um, uh, mostly consists of students from various universities um, you don't have to be a student but if you would like to work with young people together and organize your own events uh, in Japanese um, you could uh, simply join them if you have any ideas create be creative um, or you want to uh, help existing events by creating flyers or um, uh, translating stuff or so on. You can always volunteer very easily, uh, either in our office or at uh, uh, our uh, volunteers group, such as Youth uh, Network or ITEM. And um, yeah, um, definitely uh, join our petitions. That would be great. We also run a petition on uh, Marinel. Um, if you go online to our site at amnesty.or.jp, uh, there's the petition for Marinel online. It would be great if you can join. Um, these are pictures we did on uh, Global Festa. If anybody has been Global Festa in the, uh, the, the weeks before, oh, yeah, great. We did like virtual reality there. That's something very interesting. If, um, if you're around in uh, uh, the first week of November, we're going to be at ICU. ICU is going to have like a student festival, and we'll be having a booth there um, uh, promoting rights for refugees using virtual reality um, so he can be transferred. Uh, to Syria, uh, to Greece, or to a refugee camp, and just experience basically firsthand what it's like to be there. Um, it's definitely different if, as if you watch a movie. I highly recommend if you have time on November 3rd or 4th to drop by. And finally, I want to lead over uh, to Mari now. Um, so a question I get off recently um, is like, how come that Amnesty is working on climate change? Aren't you a human rights organization? What, what made you to work on climate change? And what I answer is, uh, this is the most uh, dramatic uh, threat to human rights in human history. Um, if you are concerned about the flow of refugees, which are um, 
the people are fleeing the country are um, 24, 25 million. Um, if the climate crisis gets worse, those are going to be, be tenfold, the numbers. Um, and they're going to not even be covered under the international human rights law of being refugees. Um, and the United Nations was basically calling amnesty out about not doing enough on the climate crisis because this is a human rights threat. This is not about polar bears. This is not about the ice melting in the Arctic. This is about us surviving. And the United Nations is giving us another 11 years to uh, get our act together and un if, if we don't do this, uh, we're not gonna, it's going to be too late to push the button and uh, switch back to normal. Uh, so we went to the climate march. Has anybody been there? Oh, great, quite a few number, yeah. Um, it's probably not going to be the last climate march. Definitely be there uh, for the next one again. It's been so many more people than last time. It was great to see that the mov movement in Tokyo is finally, and Japan is finally starting up. Um, yeah, again, this is our petition. Uh, I think um, the QR code might not work. Um, if it does, um, please give it a try. Otherwise, go to our website later. And um, yeah, about the, the climate crisis. So um, I just heard that there's like a super typhoon hitting towards Japan. And Marinelle was like texting me. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> why, why is that happening to me? Like, I'm in Japan, and the next two is, uh, super typhoon is like, uh, coming after me and last Saturday was the, hot, the hottest uh, uh, October day ever recorded in Japan. It was super hot, right? It was uh, 31 or 32 degrees. Last year in Japan we had that heat wave uh, that severely affected elderly people and uh, young infants. You saw the big flooding in, uh, in Japan and western Japan and washed houses away, the mudslides. Um, this is affecting our lives right now. This is not something about the future. And um, about the super typhoon, so those typhoons are going to get stronger and stronger and stronger getting forward. So this is not going to be the last one. And Marina was just 16 years old when the super typhoon hit uh, her hometown and uh, destroyed basically that area, leaving thousands of people dead. and. Millions of people were affected. And still, six years after the typhoon, um, many of these houses haven't been repaired yet. Uh, the houses that the government provided are um, not... Uh, the, the conditions there, there are issues with them. For example, the access to water, electricity, or there's just no school or like work close to it. Um, so if you move to that area, there's, there, you don't have a life. So many people actually stay in that area. Um, but I want to lead over to uh, Marinelle. And uh, uh, it would be great if you could give her a warm welcome of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Marinelle, for coming to you, Jay. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Marina Obaldo from a remote community in the coast of Salcedo. I am a daughter of a fisherman who has lived his whole life providing for his family. His life has never been easy. Life has never been easy for my father. He wasn't able to finish grade school because he needed to go out to the sea in order to provide for his family. As a child who has experienced 20 typhoons per year, calamities and disasters have become normal for me. It has been inculcated to my mind that the sea could be cruel at times, that because of our geographic location, we are more vulnerable to so many types of climatic disasters. My community, Matarina, is a coastal barangay in Salcedo, facing the Pacific Ocean. On October 2012, I was invited to give a speech for the launching of a climate change adaptation project in the Philippines. My community was one of the fortunate communities who became the beneficiary of that project. Learning about climate change made me aware of the problems we might have in the future. 
through the trainings I got in this project, I learned everything in regards to the basics of climate change. At the age of 15, I became a child facilitator. Because of the training and knowledge given to me in my role as a child facilitator, I had the opportunity to visit remote communities and schools to educate people about the causes, effects of climate change and the measures necessary to adapt and mitigate its impact. Um, so there is a video. Before I proceed, I'm sharing what happened to me and my family and my community when Typhoon Haiyan hit. So 2013 came and Typhoon Haiyan hit. The night before Haiyan's rock, we had no more electricity. Together with my whole family, we were already at the evacuation center, which was 10 meters away from our house. I brought an encyclopedia with me so I can just read until the storm passes. My bag was only filled with my phone, charger, notebook, and pen. I didn't bring any clothes with me because I thought we can go home immediately when the storm subsides. Because it has always been that way. Never did it cross my, cross my mind that we will have nothing left of our house, but only one-fourth of its flooring and about three of its columns. We did not really know what the storm surge meant until we experienced it ourselves. Around 3 a.m. on November 8, 2013, um, everyone was panicking as the winds became more strong, became more intense. We wanted to evacuate again because there might be a tsunami. I saw a woman carrying her child who almost had her head cut off because of the GA sheets blown away by the strong winds. I couldn't fully describe what was happening at that moment. There were plenty of families with their children in tow rushing to seek refuge in our evacuation center because the evacuation center they were in got destroyed. The roof, the windows, and doors of the buildings we were of the building we were in got also destroyed. Many of us got injured and because of the broken glass windows and flying debris, and eleven people died in our village. I went back to our house even though the wind were still strong, as I wanted to see if we still have a home to go back to. Although it was still dangerous for me to go back, but I wanted to save a box that has a sentimental value to me. This box was really special to me because it was filled with my personal things. My literary works, the certificates and medals I earned in school. For me, that box symbolizes who I am, my achievements, my self-worth. Nothing was left of our home and losing, losing that box felt like losing my identity my dreams, my significance as a person. Three days after Haiyan, we were left in isolation. We had nothing to eat but cassava. We had no food, no electricity, no water, no secure shelter. We had no change of clothes, so we were just all wet and cold. I was so confused of the devastated, of the reality I was facing. I was only 16 and was about to graduate high school at that time. I wasn't even sure if I can graduate high school. I lost my books, my uniform. How can I continue studying when my parents cannot afford to send me to, to school anymore because we lost our livelihood? For three months, I was not able to go to school because it got destroyed. March 2014 came. And we needed to fast track all the lessons so we could graduate by November, by April 2014. Our fishing livelihood stopped for months because my father's boat was broken and there were no fish to catch. We also couldn't bear the thought of eating fish that might have fed on the dead bodies of our neighbors and the people we knew. My father had to sail to other places just to go fishing, but he would end up with little to nothing. There was a huge depletion on fish catch after high end and it made surviving even more difficult. 
It even came to a point when my mom couldn't handle it any, anymore, so she left us for good. And thus we were faced with another dilemma. I was already in my first year college in Tacloban at that time when my father told me the news. As time passed, my father suffered from depression. He barely ate and slept. He couldn't bear to go fishing anymore, and he became suicidal. Being far from home, knowing that your family is in that painful situation, made things worse, but I had to remain strong. Tiffin Hayan made me realize that climate change is not anymore a battle we will face in the future, but a battle that we need to face today, in the present. Scientists said that Typhoon Haiyan is not yet an effect of climate change. However, it was exacerbated by climate change. Typhoons usually develop in the ocean. When the ocean surface is warm, it strengthens the intensity of the typhoon. Typhoon Haiyan was developed in the ocean. Because of the ocean, the warming of the ocean surface, Typhoon Haiyan intensi intensified and became a super typhoon before it made landfall. In the Philippines, we experience more or less 20 typhoons per year. Super Typhoon Haiyan was the strongest typhoon ever recorded in the history. If climate change continues, people, Philippines will be experiencing more and stronger typhoons. Super Typhoon would then be a normal phenomenon, and it would mean that my children will live their lives fighting and sur surviving Super Typhoons. They will not be able to experience what I was able to experience or you was able to experience when we were a kid. When destroying strongest typhoons was just signal number three. Climate change doesn't just cause super typhoons, it also causes more extreme weather events. In a tropical country like the Philippines, we have been used to heat. But now, heat is becoming something that is unbearable something that causes diseases and illnesses to people, especially to fishermen and farmers. Because of my active participation in my community and school, I was sent to Germany in July 2015 to attend an international camp. One of the outputs of that camp is the creation of an international campaign called Hashtag 2065 Your Future, in which we have gathered thousands of thrown trees made by youth from all over the world. At the conclusion of the campaign, we handed over the drawing trees to the Minister of Environment in Germany. My 2015 ended with a surprise when I was invited to speak for the opening of COP21 in Paris. It became a, a great platform for me to share my story as a survivor of Super Typhoon Haiyan and as an advocate, youth advocate, who is educating communities and schools on the basics of climate change. At first, I was so nervous to speak. Who would have thought that a youth from a remote area in Eastern Samar would be given a chance to speak in front of the world leaders and, and share the story of how we have struggled to live during and after Haiyan. I have put my heart on my speech, praying that they would listen to my story. After my speech, the crowd was silent. Then they began standing and clapping. That was really a relief for me. <laughs> I did not come to Paris with confidence that I will get that much attention. But when people and the media have asked questions from me and how they seem to be so interested, I realized that there is hope in raising one's voice. If we are not just afraid to speak and share our story, then we will be able to tell the world how the Philippines have been suffering the effects of a phenomena that we haven't caused. Because some of the countries that have historically contributed to climate change the most are still not fully feeling the effects. And that's why it's important for them to hear our stories so they can realize that it is affecting real people today. And somehow, it encourages those countries to take action. As youth, we have the energy and the power to speak and represent those who do not have the courage to stand up for themselves. My participation in advocating, advocating through the global arena did not just end in COP21. 
Just last September, I spoke during the public hearing on climate justice and liability petition conducted by, conducted by the Commission on Human Rights in New York City, USA. It made me reminisce again the reason why I started fighting for our common home. Remembering how devastated we were during the Fanhayan is hard. It makes me emotional and question life. But on the other hand, it makes me strong and heals the ones that Super Typhoon Haiyan has left in me. Sharing has been the key to healing for me. Climate change, climate change is not just an issue of adaptation and mitigation, but also an issue of human rights. Because during climatic disasters, we are being deprived of the basic rights that we, we are ought to enjoy. Research says that we just have 11 years to stop the, ra the rapid changing of our climate. The inaction of the governments around the world, including the Philippines, makes it so difficult to still hope for a brighter future. I just have passed and got my license as a social worker. And maybe next year, I will start to work. In my young age, I still have a long way to go. I have so many dreams that I want to achieve in this lifetime and a family that I want to build. But because of inaction and denial of our government to climate crisis, it seems that my future is becoming unsure. First world countries like Japan can do a lot more to lessen the effect of climate change and eventually stop this crisis. With the resources that you have, you can help mitigate climate change. In small steps like choosing not to use single-use plastics, using renewable, renewable energies, educating young people and adults about climate change, and calling the government to make or strengthen laws that will solve the climate crisis, you can already make a big impact to the world. Last month has been heartbreaking for me, seeing the Amazon and other forests around the world on fire and the increasing number of environmental defenders, environment def defenders being killed in the Philippines made me weep and lose hope. But always remember that you can be like Leonardo DiCaprio. You can be like Nelson Mandela or even Mother Teresa. You can be whoever you want to be as long as you put your heart into what you want to become. Find the thing that drives you and passionately work and fight for that. There are so many things that you can do to protect Mother Earth. You can be an individual educating the communities. You can participate in organizations who are focused on protect, protecting the sea. You can be there at the streets pushing the legislators to make laws and prohibiting the, sing the use of single-use plastic. There are so many things that you can do to be in this fight. Also, in the Philippines, we have, um, we have created this 10 youth-led climate actions. This is so doable. This is, um, environ this is for lifestyle and individual. It can, you can use it on your, you can change your lifestyle and follow this 10 um, youth-led climate actions. So first is consume responsibly. Um, do not take all the food in the in canteen or wherever. Just take whatever that you could consume. Refuse single-use plastics. Walk, bike, or carpool, or take the public transportation. Leave no traces when traveling. Do not just throw trashes or garbages everywhere. Pra practice urban gardening. Grow a tree, not just plant a tree, but grow a tree. Promote renewable energy. Foster environmental and energy consciousness. Contribute and share eco da data. You can also, of course, join the Fridays for Future Japan Tokyo. I have heard that they have um, a lot of people. It was like 10 times than the, than the last climate strike this and we will have another global climate strike in November. I hope you could attend that one. You could also petition, make a petition, or support petition, campaigns, do campaigns, or write in your field. If you're a journalist, you can write about climate change. If you're on your field, in, in every field, in every 
whatever field you are right now, you can always do something to protect the Mother Earth in your little ways. Of course, big changes start from small, small steps. So if we will do not be afraid that I am the only one doing this now because you don't know that there are other 8 million people who are individually doing it. So you don't know how much impact you're actually creating. You can also contribute, of course, to charities or to organizations who are um, in this fight, like Amnesty, like Greenpeace or Plan International and other um, organizations that you know. You can, of course, also be at our event on October 11 at 6.30 in Amnesty office. It is more like, if you want, it's Friday, right? It's Friday this Friday. If you want to network, if you have an idea, we can, took, you, we can talk deeper about your idea and how you could be in this fight and how you could be with me in this fight. If you want, please be there and attend that. Um, yeah. And you can also sign our petition. For, this, is not, this is not just for me, but this is for all the vulnerable communities in the Philippines. This, I am just a representation, and there are more my stories, just one of the stories of thousands of Filipinos who have been affect, affected by Super Typhoon Haiyan. And, and there are maybe other stories that are worse than my story. So if you want to help us, just please sign the petition. Um, but all you need to do is to find that one thing that can pour your heart, your energy, and your passion into. Do not underestimate your power to make a change in the world. I repeat, do not underestimate your power to make a change in this world. The future of all of us depends on the decision, on your decision now. So please join me and make a difference. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for the really motivating and inspiring speech. I wanted to ask you a question about um, what your thoughts were on the best means of action in terms of tackling climate change. So I was living in London and I was actually working at Greenpeace and it was at a time where Extinction Rebellion was very important and they are still growing in their public support and their ability to make it in, into the media. Um, in Japan, I noticed that there isn't as much direct action in terms of climate change action. What do you think you, um, the best means of being impactful um, in, a, in an environment where direct action isn't as ex ac acceptable? And also, what do you think of Extinction Rebellion and their ability to change policy? Because it seems like you do a lot of, of talks in um, a lot of diplomatic arenas and not necessarily from outside chaining yourself to buildings or parliament. So you're speaking, you're, you're at the table. So I was interested in what you thought about that. I also actually do loan protest <laughs> in, in front of big corporations. Um, I'm one of the petitioner of the um, first in the world petition for climate justice and liability. Um, we have sent this petition to the Commission on Human Rights and we, uh, we conducted um, hearings in Manila, in London, London and in New York for that petition. And just recently, just uh, September 14th and 19th, I did a loan peti petition in front of the Shell um, company in the Philippines. So um, with your question, what could be the most the strategy to tackle um, climate change in Japan as so they don't have any direct um, way? It, for me, it really depends on the culture of the, of, of, of the nation. In the Philippines, there is also a stigma. Uh, if you do rally, you're stigmatized, you're being red tag and you're being killed. So um, I think here in Japan, the most, uh, because people are not tackling about it, and I have been to Meiji University and they seem to be just listening and there is no, um, there is no like, an an avenue for them to talk about it. So maybe, for me, I really believe in education first. So if there will be a great um, 
um, like dissemination of information, the media could be one of the best um, platform to to tell these um, people that climate change is is existing and it is affecting real people today, and maybe they would because they just it's not that they don't care they just don't know that this issue is existing and it is getting bigger and we don't have any time actually to still have a debate if we will act of it or if we will not act on it because we science says that we just have 11 years to tackle this so for me media has really the great um they have the great it's a great platform for to reach more people to reach more um, Japanese people to tackle about this issue. Yeah, I hope I, I answered your question. And that was, uh, the Extinction Rebellion. Ah, the Extinction Rebellion. Um, I didn't really work with Extinction But you know, there is a great power in big voice. If, if people are united, if people are there in the street being united, we could always um, change laws. We can always amend laws. In the Philippines, it happens. We have our rights. We have our new our women's and LGBT rights now because of people who, who were in the street, who were pushing the legisla legislators and showing that they care, showing that they, they want a change in the system and it's really important to show that you care care and you want a change in the system because like in Tacloban we I personally do not just want to be a mere victim I just I want to label my sur myself as a survivor only and not doing anything I want Taklobanon I want youth in Tacloban to show to the world to prove to the world that we are not just victims we are not just a youth who, who are just mere receiver of aid after a disaster. We're also, we can be also proactive. We can also do more and, and advise and convince our legislators to act on this crisis. So yeah. Hi, Marinelle, thank you for sharing your story and uh, giving us the reality of, of what may be coming in the future more and more. Before I ask my question, I'd just like to tell the lady who asked about Extinction Rebellion, because apparently they're having a die-in yeah. in, sh in uh, yeah, Yoyogi Park, Yogi Park at three o'clock on Saturday. So if you want to do an Extinction Rebellion activity, you can go there. Marina, I wonder if you could talk to us. I know that you came to Japan to take part in the um, Al Gore um, climate reality uh, leadership training. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us something about that and how you feel about, in terms of both the, the, the rich countries where a lot of this activity is going on, and also how this may help in the Philippines. Thank you. Um, it was the first time, actually, that Al Gore um, had this event, the climate reality training by Al Gore. And I think, uh, People in Japan needs that kind of training, needs that kind of uh, enlightenment, maybe. Um, that uh, in other countries, I know like people in Japan are so busy. I understand how they have their own thing. And I, and I felt that the training was actually successful because it gathered around 800 people, and like half of it are Japanese. Half of it business people. Are from business people, and they're from business people, and they they're the one who actually have to maybe have a shift in their business practices. Like we know about coal um, issue here in Japan. So I think that's, that's like a direct um, approach of Al Gore to really invite those businesses, business people to go and attend so they would know about this dilemma that we are having right now. And as for the question if what the rich country can do for, Philippine, for underdeveloped countries like the Philippines, of course, as, I, as I've said, you have all the resources um, you have all the technology and the resources, and the, you could really do something bigger.
to help countries like the Philippines not suffer more. Because we didn't, of course, I always say that I, all, I appreciate, we appreciate the help from the international community after Typhoon Haiyan, but the, the help after the disaster could not bring back the lives of our loved ones. It could not bring back the lives of our friends and neighbors who died because of that disaster. It could, hit, it could help us rebuild, but uh, you know, after Haiyan, we have rebuilt. But just weeks after that, there was another typhoon that came and just washed away all of the repaired um, makeshift houses that we have built. So as I, I asked myself, what is the point of rebuilding actually? What is the point of, of giving this aid if we will suffer more, if we are not really solving the real, the root cause of this? So if you will, if rich countries will just donate money to, to to underdeveloped countries like the Philippines after Super Typhoon, it makes no sense to me because if they really want to help, they will change the business practices in their countries. They will do, um, they will help change the system in their country. So the Philippines, who is just contributing 0.003% of the carbon emission. It is just a drop in the ocean emission. Yet we are bearing the brunt of climate change. And it's just so unfair for us to suffer and to, and, and to blame ourselves because we did not, I mean, we did not cause this. It's 70% of the carbon emission came from big, big corporations and they should be held accountable. Don't be shy to ask a question. I'll, I'll just raise a question here. Can you return to your village and your personal experience and tell us about the impact that this had upon your local community and also um, has this like politically activated your friends or family or people that you know? The, the movement yeah. of, for I climate mean, change? Your, your experience and your activism. Um, it actually fuels my activism. My, my, is that your question? If the experience of Super Typhoon Haiyan? I'm wondering how your, your family and friends uh, think about your activism oh, okay. and if they've also started to participate in this. Yeah, in climate change activism, climate change adaptation and mitigation and climate justice campaigns are growing. It is a growing movement especially in the Philippines. In Tacloban, we have been organizing, um, we have been organizing Fridays for Future events, climate strikes, and also in my hometown. And it is actually because of, because you know, in the Philippines, we suffer 20, more or less 20 typhoons per year. So there are a lot of people who just think that the super typhoon is just a normal thing, that it, it just so happened that it was so strong. It just so happened that it was a super typhoon high end. And I think because they see me um, advocating for this, for climate justice, they see my activism and it is, um, and I am going to remote communities, to schools and other parts of, of, of the Philippines, they tend to, um, they tend to question and be curious that, oh, so this is not just, a natural thing. My father is a fisherman. He wasn't able to go to school, so he doesn't, he can't read and write. So it is so hard for fishermen like him, people in, in my community, to limonize the concept of climate change, to make them understand that this phenomena is not a natural thing. This phenomena is a problem, and it is not just a natural thing that happened. Because sometimes, um, I did this research just this August, and it saddened me that people in my community, um, they know that the, um, that super typhoon, that typhoons could be, they told me that it was their first time to actually um, experience super typhoon like that. They're 57 years old, they're 60 years old, and it was their first time to to experience that, that kind of, of 
typhoon. And when I asked them if what do they think um, caused it, they just said like because I burned plastic, because I, I it was the blame was in, in the individual blame and in the in the, in the on the individual, and. So that's my neighbors, and they see me in social media, like um, doing this protest in front of big corporations, um, organizing these events, and they tend to be curious on, on, on what am I actually doing. So it it is becoming a good platform for me to broaden the topic and tell them in a way that they would understand what is this activism all about? What is this climate justice campaign all about? And I'm happy that I started with my family and they have been, I think, baptized. <laughs> they have been, um, they, I, I was able to, to, to tackle about this climate change because this is not really a simple, um, a simple concept to, to share, you know, it, needs to be laymanized it needs it needs to be simple for people like for um, fishermen and farmers could comprehend thank you very much for coming and sharing your your story with us it's it's uh it's it's terrible that that uh, young people and people who bear no responsibility for causing the ex the climate damage and intensification of of many kinds of natural disasters which is, pro which is certainly going to get worse even if we were to stop emitting greenhouse gases today. It's, it's, uh, we've already baked in quite a lot of continuing change. I guess my question is, um, can, can you see, you described how the uh, rebuilding in your community at home is, is uh, does it, it sounds like uh, some of the rebuilt pl structures have already been damaged by subsequent typhoons. Can you see any improvement in the style of rebuilding, in the approach of the local community, or the kind of assistance that you get from the international community, or the leadership from the Philippine government, both local and national? Is there any resonance with with the with with the facts on the ground that have you know that are that are? It wasn't a one-off, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah, that's so sad to <laughs> answer, actually, because up until now, we haven't been relocated yet. <laughs> we are still on the water. Up until now, my house is still under repaired. We haven't really, the local government unit wasn't able to give us a relocation area. So we were still on the water living now. And that's, um, you know, that's the sad thing about being in an underdeveloped country because of lack of resources like that, so people could be, people could be um, safe when there will be disaster that might come again. Um, in other parts of Eastern Samar, there is also still um, an ongoing reconstruction reconstru of relocation sites, six years after Haiyan. People ha are, still on their own where we, they were during Super Typhoon Haiyan. And it's, it's really tricky about relocating families because if it means relocating, it means like giving them livelihoods in the area where they were relocated. S example, in our case, my father would really want to relocate if the government would give him another source of income. My, my father has been fishing all his life. The only skill that he knows is fishing. If we will be relocated in the mountain, he doesn't know how to farm. So it would be um, a challenge for our government how they would um, how they would answer, how they would solve that issue. Because up until now, six years after high end, it's still an issue. It's still um, not being solved. So I don't know if there is a change in the re in the construction of buildings because even there are no buildings. <laughs> yeah, so I hope I answered your question. Okay, this is kind of tall for me, sorry. Okay. Kyle, help. Oh, 
I was going for the wrong one. Okay, so thank you for sharing your story, first of all. Um, I kind of like started crying a little bit, so you're impacting at least one person today very deeply. But um, so I just wanted to ask, my own father does not believe in climate change. And so I wanted to know if you've had to face any people that were such stringent non-believers and like, how do you navigate that conversation and how do you kind of convince them like, this is real, this is a real problem that we really need to care about especially when someone has like, you know, financial power, voting power that they should be using. Thank you. That's a really great question. I encounter a lot of people every day who are like that. <laughs> and I always ask them about about their about their um status in life. Um and I always ask them like um do you are you living are you living in a comfortable home? Do you have a place to stay, a food to eat? Do you you don't you don't um, worry that tomorrow you will not have anything? If you have that, well, congratulations! You're so you are blessed. Because if you don't believe in climate change, go to places like my hometown, where you entirely um, just entirely relying on the sea. Imagine yourself being a fisherman, having a housewife and three, and three children, or five children, relying entirely on the sea. And because of climate change, the coral reefs are bleaching. Because of climate change, the, the fishes are migrating to deeper seas. Because of climate change, it changes just how your relationship with the nature and with the sea. Imagine yourself not having any fish for like one week or one month because of this rapid change of our climate, because of this unpredictable change of our climate. The, and imagine yourself not having anything to feed your family, to, feed your, to give your family their basic needs. Imagine being in this community relying entirely on the environment and being hit by a large typhoon. Would you think, would you not believe that? And you have been, imagine that you have been a fisherman your whole life. Like if you're 50 years old, 60 years old from now, do you see the patterns? Do you see the change in the patterns? If you see that, then that might be an effect of climate change. If you believe that that is just a natural phenomena, because some people say that it is just a natural phenomena, then, um, then why is it that uh, now it's, uh, it's becoming more and more like a way of life? Super typhoons are becoming more natural. When you were just 20 years old, 30 years old, the super typhoons was just signal number three, and now it's category number five. So, like, imagine, being that person, would you not still believe that there, that climate change is existing? That's then the conversation will just. <laughs> I hope I helped you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for opportunity to uh, talk about climate change with this uh, wonderful event. Uh, my question is the role of education and uh, public uh, opinions about climate change because the education which, uh, which I experienced at the high school in Japan, it, it was uh, about seven years ago, uh, the textbook told students the climate issue is the conflict between our environment and the economic activity. I refused that idea, but the teacher get, gets very, got very angry and forced to silence me, and they, uh, he, he, uh, he, he said, yeah, look, this is the conflict be between rich people and poor people. And the poor, poor countries like Philippines has a right to consume coal and oils to develop their, their own countries. I think 
that kind of idea is still, rema still remaining in some people's minds. So, and, and if we look at the, the uh, uh, circuses against the Greta Turnberry recent weeks in Japanese Twitter and Facebook, it, it is also happening. The poor countries have a right to ban calls or if rich Europeans talk about end of the world, the poor people are thinking about the end of the month with the, the, the with about their incomes. So how how can we uh, tackle this kind of uh, ideas? Thank you. Sorry for my poor English. Thank you. Develop. They still need to develop, right? So aren't they like, don't they have the right to use like this dirty energy such as coal and oil, which the rich countries did to develop to come to the point where they are? Mm. And do, they, do you think that the Philippines, for example, as a poorer country has the right to burn coal as much as they want to come to a standard such as Japan, for example? Hmm. <laughs> I just, I came, I, I just remember, um, I was also giving a talk in, in a prestigious university in the Philippines, and there it was, it was like a private and an expensive university, so there, the, the students are elite. So there was one um, student who asked me like, how, because there is like, there is um, like, if you know Tondo, but you don't know that. But Tondo is a place in the Philippines where the squatters are. This, it is like a squatter area. So she asked me, like, how can you tell people in Tondo, those in the squatter, to stop polluting the earth, to stop, um, to stop, uh, uh, to stop getting or buying sachets and pol stop polluting the earth? So, you know, it makes me remember like how rich people and poor people see climate change because um, uh, I, I will finish my story because I felt that um, sometimes to reach, maybe this is also true to countries to reach um, people think that because the poor people are getting this sachets or they're polluting the earth because of the plastics. But I told them that um, let's stop. It is a challenge for us as students to stop the narrative that it is individual's fault that we are facing this crisis because those poor people, maybe those poor people can just afford the plastics and they can't af afford to buy the bulk in the bottle. So they don't have even a choice to, to buy the bigger one because even they don't have even food on their table. So they just get the sachets because that's more affordable for them and that's more accessible for them. So it's not the, 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 poor's, the poor's fault that they are um, that they are consuming these plastics, but because they, this is the system that is giving them this alternative which is not sustainable for the development of that country. And you're asking if, if the Philippines has also the right to burn co coal, right? Well, poor, poorer countries. So they could be rich like countries like Japan. Um, nobody has the right, actually. Yeah, so this is, pretty, this is a very good question, actually. Um, and I'm glad you asked this because uh, um, uh, it reminds me that, you know, 
those are one of the arguments that um, the, the people who are not accepting uh, the man-made climate change uh, that are, uh, don't think it's as urgent to take. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, countries such as Japan, um, number one, uh, if you count from the industrial age, is the United States, no surprise, and then of course European countries such as Germany and England um, have burned like a lot of coal so far. And now it's China is number one, but if you take the past 150 years to the United States, um, so yeah, and they came to that standard of living because they used like really cheap energy, such as coal and oil, um, which uh, propelled them to a level where they are right now. And um, of course, you could easily make the argument and say like, yes, um, um, all the developing nations, they should have the right to use like this cheap energy now and uh, get on the same um, standard. Why should they just uh, um, refrain from that when the industrial na uh, nice, uh, nations who can now afford maybe uh, to use like uh, um, uh, energy uh, from solar and wind. Um, so the answer that I would give is probably that it's a, it's a duty from uh, industrial nice nations to help the developing countries um, to use uh, renewable energy um, to uh, install solar panels on the roofs, to uh, install wind power, to install uh, other forms of energy that are um, environmentally friendly. And um, of course, it's easier said than done, right? I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's an appeal that we have to make. It's a duty that they have. But the good news is that um, Renewable energy is really, really getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, it comes to the point that it's actually cheaper now than using coal or oil. And even though that uh, coal and o uh, coal has been subsidized very, very heavily by the governments, um, if it wasn't, uh, your renewable energy would be even cheaper. Um, uh, and this is big potential. Um, you see um, countries in, in Africa where they had absolutely no electricity so far on the, in the, on the uh, little roofs in the villages. And they got installed uh, solar panels, for example, now. And it's the first time they even have light in their little home that they have. So they're basically a leapfrog uh, to the re renewable energy stage. Um, so in that sense, it's a duty from, uh, I mean, in the end, we're living on the same planet. Um, so if we allow the developing nations to burn as much coal as, as we did in Japan or in Europe or in America, uh, we're not going to survive anymore. Um, so we have to stop subsidizing uh, fossil fuels. And by that money that we save, we could easily um, for, uh, promote renewable energy in developing countries. We just have to want to do it. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, another typical way of Japanese people thinking is that uh, in the longer term, we can, we'll be able to decrease the uh, fossil fuels, but uh, in the shorter term, uh, it's difficult. And then many people, uh, some people say that, yeah, we have to rely on the nuclear power plant. But, but uh, also uh, due to the nuclear power plant accident eight years ago, many people are really negative about the nuclear power plant. So many people think that we have to continue to rely on fossil fuels. <laughs> it's uh, another type of uh, typical way of thinking in, in Japan. So uh, do you have any comment on this aspect? Was that a question uh, towards Maria or? Um, can oh, I? Uh, any of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, yeah, um, I absolutely can, can see that concern. Um, uh, and I can see um, the people don't want to use nuclear power. And I'm personally very happy that uh, these pe uh, many people have this opinion. And I would not advocate uh, for uh, using nuclear power as a source of um, more eco-friendly uh, energy. Um, so if they say it's not possible to go 100% renewable energy, I would not agree with that. Um, because uh, Japan has lots of potential using, for example, wind power. Um, it's an island in the ocean. If they had uh, installed, for example, more floating uh, wind offshore uh, wind uh, uh, plan power plants, 
there's lots of potential in that way. Um, Japan is an island that uh, uh, has a lot of volcanoes and hot springs, right? So there's all this thermal heat that's had such a great potential. And uh, Japan is actually subsidizing coal, to my knowledge. So um, apparently, um, without any subsidies, it wouldn't as cheap uh, as, it, as it would be uh, without it. Um, and by the way, um, I heard that they are planning to actually buy a new coal power plant, if you have heard about that, in uh, Yokosuka. And the, uh, the p there are some people living in Yokosuka actually suing the government now, because like, how can you build a new coal fire power plant in Japan during these days? How is that possible? Um, and Japan also uh, is uh, contributing to coal, to new coal of, uh, power plants in uh, Vietnam and other countries. So unfortunately, Japan is still promoting that energy, not even in Japan, but also abroad. Um, so, but to answer your question, I think it would be absolutely possible to use 100% uh, renewable energy in Japan. Uh, you, do, you would not have to import that. Um, I could imagine that Japan imports energy now. Um, sorry, I did, I'm not too firm into that topic. But I personally think the, just uh, if you look at wind power and also solar, it would be absolutely possible to uh, get this 100%. Just look at all the roofs that you have here, like in, in Tokyo. If you put solar panel on it, it would be very, very easy to, uh, to get this to 100% renewable energy. Um, and maybe well, not, not speaking from an amnesty standpoint, just from a personal standpoint, um, if you want to promote that kind of movement, for example, well, Marina said it doesn't start from, uh, it's not about individual, uh, individuals uh, changing their uh, behaviors, it's about, it's a policy issue, absolutely. But to get the policy moving, maybe it's the first step that you could do is to change your energy provider, for example. So uh, this kind of doesn't come from me as an amnesty, uh, it comes to me personally. Um, so you don't have to use uh, fossil fuel if you don't want to. There are energy providers in Japan who provide 100% renewable energy to you. If you like to use that, you can easily change that. It only takes you a few minutes on your smartphone to change it. So to put a bit of pressure and uh, maybe and to promote that um, movement, uh, that's maybe a good first step. Yeah, and with the and with your resources in Japan, you could really make that happen. It's just in the political will of the leaders and for the people also to to convince them and to really like push them to make a real shift to renewable energy. In addition to my previous questions, I'd like to ask two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, is there uh, some strong public public opinion or of opinion from the leaders about the poor, poor countries have still have right to burn coal, like the, like in Philippines? The second question is, how can we uh, tackle that kind of ideas? The, 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 oh, the, the poor, many, many uh, so-called opinion leaders, many from right sector, are uh, promoting they have poor people have right to burn coals. They are promoting that kind of opinion on Twitter or medias. So how can we tackle? It is just like actually telling that you have all the right to destroy the mother earth. <laughs> if you think, no, 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 sorry. I, it's not against you or I'm just commenting. Um, you have answered. So I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question correctly. I'm sorry. Yeah. He's asking about the right wing and uh, uh, the right wing. and, and, and the. Uh, first question is uh, about the leaders in Philippines or as a poor country. As a poor uh, country, poor if we have the right. Previously, China always claimed that kind of idea. Oh, okay. And uh, the second one is uh, mainly happening in Japanese internet media, 
leaders, and many people, uh, many so-called opinion leaders, leaders from uh, right-wing sector, mainly is promoting that kind of They have mm. to has like to uh, call. Like that is a propaganda maybe. That is maybe propaganda too. Mm. Yeah, how to break that. Um, first, uh, Twitter can be very toxic, uh, <laughs> and uh, Facebook as well, and other social media. Um, m my personal advice would be um, to ignore these people. Uh, definitely don't share anything, don't even click on it, because that's how it gets viral on the internet. Um, but of course, they're being successful, obviously. But um, the thing is, like, it might sound that actually so many people are like uh, climate change deniers, or say it's like, oh, why? I know it exists, but there's nothing we can do because, like, they we have to use coal and so on. So, but I don't think it's actually that many. It's like a, a very vocal like minority being on the internet. That would be my opinion. Um, and yeah, how to tackle this one? I mean. Basically, I, what I answered my, my last answer is like we only have this one planet. We have 11 years um, to get uh, to reduce our emissions. We have to get to zero. And um, yeah, of course, um, the developing countries they have a right to develop, right? They have to divide to develop. Um, but if they use as much coal as we had did, we would just um, absolutely crush our planet. Yeah. Um, it's just not an option. So what we need to do we is need uh, we need to help them to get uh, to use uh, eco-friendly um, energy. That's just the only way. Um, otherwise, th these country will grow for sh uh, a certain time their economy, um, but eventually, this economy will crush. Uh, in a couple of decades, uh, just simply because our planet will not be able to handle this anymore. Like, if we don't do, if we don't get our act together, our Earth is going to increase by like four degrees or more. Um, so a lot of uh, places will just be uninhabitable. You're just not able to live there anymore. And um, these economies that might grow in the developing countries, thanks to uh, using uh, cheap fossil fuels, uh, um, Eventually, these people who can save their own lives uh, uh, when the planet is going down is going to only be a few rich people. The, um, so if we really want to help these developing countries, we have to do, uh, help them uh, develop and use a uh, 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 carbon-free energy source. Uh, I can understand these arguments, but it's just not realistic to do that anymore. I think that is more like brainwashing. Like, um, it is, actually for me, it's just synonymous when you say that it is your fault that you're poor, but you have the right to be developed, you have the right to, to also, um, like, use the coal for you to be developed. I think it is just a propaganda or just a brainwashing thing. And, of course, I mean, for me, Oh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, th thank you, of course, both of you being here. Um, just a quick comment. You had mentioned that uh, coal, there might be a new coal refinery or something in Yokosuka. Mm -hmm. I'd heard rumors that they might be trying to put one in Chiba around Kisarazu yeah. or Ichihara. I don't know if there's any follow up. I don't know. I just heard from a source. So um, I got a couple questions. I'm not really sure if the first one's totally answerable or not, but it follows along this line with deniers and haters and such. But um, I noticed when kind of Greta hit the scene and then the climate strikes can't kind of blew up and stuff, for a short time we kind of took control of the narrative, um, but immediately that media kind of is kind of drifting back the other direction and, and now the haters are making it a personal attack and such, excuse me. Um, and kind of changing the focus of the issue, what's really, what's happening and stuff. And I don't really want to know if anybody's personally attacking you in that manner or not, but I was just curious, how do we amplify your stories, people like yourselves and Greta and everybody else who's involved in not dividing these people up, but realizing we're a collective and stay holistic in the nature. 
Um, amplifying these stories and trying to silence the haters and the deniers and the ability to do that. I don't know if that's an answerable question for anyone here. Um, um, a second thing part, if you don't mind me just jumping right to it, is if there are any recommendations for people who want to be more active in, in making an influence about people around us, because uh, that's maybe as good as we can do, um, especially here in Japan, since that's where we are, right? How to maybe pull in one or two more people who then, I guess we could pyramid scheme it, so to speak. Pro probably the wrong terminology to use. Um, but we, we could find a way to get those people around us to become a little more active as well and not be so passive. And anyhow, I think those are my two points. Thank you. And the question that if there are people who are attacking me, the question was like, how can we amplify? How can we support oh, okay. you? And the yeah, how can we, we support you, amplify your voices, yeah. and, and to try to make people realize that those attacks really are, well, the sites ad hominem, and they're usually fallacies and have no merit. How do we silence that and get your voices out there? If Reclaim the narrative. Well, Fridays for Future have really done a great job in silencing the haters, especially because of the great movement of the big number of people. I think we need more like this events where people could talk, where people could share. My story, as I've said, my story is just one of many. There are many more stories there, maybe worse than my story, not just in the Philippines, but maybe in other countries. So maybe just to give these people a chance to talk about their personal experience and their activism, and that show to the people that this is happening, and this is, and there are evidences, and we, I am, I am a living evidence that climate change makes people suffer and and i think uh, like because this is not just science that is crystal clear this is reality and science that is speaking if you say the the science is really clear that we just have these years this 11 years to combat climate change to tackle and to address climate change but if you want to have more inspiration other than science, there are real life stories that are here available to to um, make you um, to make you realize that if it's not happening to you now, that might, that this might happen to you maybe in the future, and it's just now. If these people are suffering already now, you might suffer also in the future. Um, people in Japan should amplify and escalate the, the movement. If you are, um, it is already a great thing that like 2,800 people yeah. came to Fridays for Future. May, we need more mo more movement like that to to really um, push people to or to get the attention of people that this issue should be um, should be addressed now we don't need we don't have any time so if keep on talking about this keep on sharing about this keep on um keep on retweeting this in your social media account so it could reach to people it could reach to those who don't even know what is this issue so if you use your social media in a way that would actually um, inform people that this is happening and we should act now this is, you can do it in your individual, individually, you can do it in a group, like being in a group with the Fridays for Future people, being in a group, organize yourself and do things like this one. This is a great platform to share ideas, to share experiences and to share what we can do to, to um, address this crisis. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much. So, and. Uh, once more, it would be great if uh, the, uh, you, uh, you come to Elvin, uh, if you could sign the petition that's calling on the Philippine government because uh, six years even after the typhoon, as Marina said, like there only a few, only half of the houses have been built and have been built in places where there are no schools or no work. And um, people eventually decide to still live in the same place. And if the next monster typhoon hits, it might be just game over. Uh, 
So um, you could either go to our website. I have like a couple of uh, copies on paper. I can put them on the table. And if you could maybe come uh, after the talk and sign the petition. Um, in, in the end, I mean, the, the climate crisis is a global crisis. So it help, you can call on the Japanese government. You can try to change uh, things uh, in the Japanese society by uh, going to events. Um, but you could, or signing petitions, sharing with your friends on social media, and so on. But of course, you can also calling on the governments in your home countries or uh, other or governments, such as our petition and the Philippine government, because eventually, if they move, it's going to be good for the earth and for everybody, uh, because we sa we share the same planet. And my appeal would really be for everybody. Um, even if you decide not to sign the petition, would be just uh, don't keep this what you learned or uh, what you felt or why you came to this event today. Don't keep this for yourself. Share it at least with, let's say, two people. Go leave this event and today, tomorrow, please share it with two people. You could either talk to your colleague at work or your, um, you uh, Twitter something or share an article on the internet. Uh, sign a petition or um, uh, share uh, other upcoming events that don't climate change. Um, just don't keep it for yourself because that's how you create a movement. Everybody just uh, contacts two friends and they try to contact two friends. Then we already got a few hundred people who are now acting on climate change. That would be really great. Hello. Um, so thank you for telling us about your organization and thank you for telling us about your very moving story. So I personally believe that the change starts with us as individuals because our consumption habits completely fuel the bigger organizations. Of course, the coal and fossil fuel situation is also very dangerous and very important. Um, however, for instance, half the um, CO2 emissions in the world are are coming from the meat industry and one of the main reasons the Amazon is burning because some people are paying other people to burn trees down for more space to to breed cattle. Um, so I also come from a third world country um, and people in my country don't really understand what's going on. They don't really care actually. They would say things like, I cannot even help myself, why would I help, help the planet or other people? Um, but lately, I've been seeing a lot of posts on Instagram and Facebook condemning the government and protesting against, against the government activities. Um, so I, I kind of feel like some people um, put all the blame on the organizations, on the bigger organizations, because it's an easier thing to do rather than changing their lifestyles. So do you believe that our personal lifestyles, what we buy, what we eat, and what we consume is as important as um, government activities? And if yes, then how can we shift back to the attention to us and the harm we make, we um, create in our planet? It is really um, different if you come from a poor country and a rich country. Of course, in a rich country, you have options. And if you want to change your lifestyle, you have the option to change your lifestyle. You have the option to go um, vegetarian You have because you have the option and you have the money and the resources to do that. But in the Philippines, who barely have that option, who just, um, who just depend on survival, on daily survival, we don't even know if we can have food tomorrow or, in the, or next week. So what is really accessible and affordable for, for us, we would take that so it is lifestyle is important in because change must that's true change must start from ourselves because it's mo big things comes from small things so it's really it's it has like uh, you cannot just uh, um it's good to have some option and to change your lifestyle of course the the your decision on what to eat and what to buy it is a really um it's good that you know what is more environmentally friendly but the, this kind of having this decision is already a luxury in the philippines 
we don't, as I've said, we don't have that option to go vegetarian because the free, uh, but the free in my community is fish. We can get the, the in bulk. We can we can do grocery and get those things in bulk because what is affordable for us is just plast is just um, the the plastic, the sachets. So there is a a a sachet economy in our village. But if the corporations would change this, their business practices, they know already the um, implication of their business practices, yet some of them just continue for profit. So if this organization, if the changes would change and and will provide more um, environmentally friendly. If they will change how they how they do things, how they package their um, their their products, maybe the consumers will follow. And the consumers, if it's m more accessible to poor people, that's the thing that they could get. Because decades ago, we don't have plastics. We just love we we lived in we lived in 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 the world like we just we 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 carry our own tote bag we carry our own echo bag we carry our own bags, basket going to the supermarket and we have lived with that we have our our, our own container containers we don't we don't um consume single use plastic we don't use the the styrofoam um packet like the lunchbox styrofoam we don't use that because the, that was not that was not um the, there was no there was no plastic that time but here comes the convenience of plastics here comes the hassle free um thing of plastic then people just grab it because it's there it's affordable it's accessible for them so if the co if the system would change and the, this corporation this would change their business practices maybe we could have a shift they can yeah um just to add to that um Absolutely, I think it's important to, th to think about like what we can all do ourselves, uh, especially as an issue of um, raising more awareness and conscience uh, for oneself, but maybe also among friends. And uh, once that awareness uh, is there, um, and at, at some point we need to call on governments and uh, companies because 70% of all CO2 in the atmosphere comes from 100 companies, from 100 corporations. So even if we, as individuals, um, decide not to emit uh, any uh, carbon going forward anymore, we just reduce it by 30% at the maximum. Um, so uh, yes, of course, that 30% is very important. But I think it's the most important is because like, if you uh, get more conscious and take the steps for your own, then um, you might want to do uh, get more effects uh, going forward and uh, you hopefully call on governments and corporations uh, as, a, as a next step. Um, but if you're, for example, interested in like how could you reduce your carbon footprint, there are like actually um, sites on the internet, like I think carbonfootprint.com and others, we can actually calculate your own carbon footprint. And you might be surprised where your carbon uh, comes from. So for example, for, for me, it's, uh, I think I, or I thought I was living quite uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, until a couple of years ago when I looked up like how damaging, for example, uh, getting on an airplane is. Um, I knew it's bad, but it's, it was way, way more bad than I thought. So um, not driving a car, getting a uh, vegetarian, um, not using any plastic anymore would not make up for me getting on a plane to, to Europe once and back. Um, so if, for example, if you want to promote that or if you want to see what you can do on your own, you could go to the sites and maybe look up what's a carbon footprint and there are definitely some ideas that could come up from that. Everyone um, starts from ourselves, right? Every advocacy starts from ourselves. We should walk the talk. Of course, I myself change first before I, I am here speaking to you all. But that was also my misconception when I was um, educating the communities, like saying that you, 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 you are the reason why we have this climate change. You know, the anxiety that it brings you that you are actually the cause of why Typhoon High End occurred. 
that that thing that anxiety that you have even because if there are disasters mental health is not really like a topic people just think that they will be okay in their own way in their own pace there was no even um, an avenue for us to ventilate to process what happened and adding up that anxiety that we as individuals because we are we are um, using plastics because we are using um, single-use plastic is an add up anxiety to us. And by the way, plastics do not um, emit when you use them. It's when they manufacture it that is emitting, that it emits carbon footprints, carbon emissions. So. Okay, um, I have a maybe I don't know a strange question, but are there any green politicians in the Philippines or politicians that are empathetic towards the green movement? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are actually, but the th yeah, there are, and they're so passionate about it. We're just um, sometimes there are green politicians. But because they're just the only, they think that they're just the only one doing a change in the system, they're being eaten up by the system. Mm -hmm. So other, um, if you're if the one I know is a counselor, so other counselors like there are like twelve or eleven counselors in our city, and she's the only one that is supporting the environmental causes, and all the other counselors are like. Why are you supporting this? We should be this, we should be this, and we should be this. We should support this business, we should. So it's really, um, there are no, it's not enough. Not enough green politicians in the decision making arena. Mm -hmm. And we need more. We need more green politicians in those decision making level. And um, just one other question, I, I don't know, maybe somebody in the audience could answer. Um, in Japan, like, is there an organization that um, identifies politicians here who are uh, more green than other politicians? It really for, depends for, on the for, process. For people to vote. That's where I'm thinking the power I, is. It's in the voting. People have to vote for the people who are going to change these things. So um, I'm just wondering in the Philippines about voting too, um, you know, what the ratio is and do people think they have power by voting? That's a good question. Uh, uh, because in the Philippines, voters are so loyal to whoever they, they, um, they know in the politics, even their actors and actresses, if they know them, they will just vote for them. Illiteracy is high in the Philippines. So whoever is famous, they vote for him. And there is also a green propaganda and greenwashing of politicians that we support this cleanup drive, we support this coastal cleanup, we support this tree planting and all of this um, greenwashing things just to just to save themselves from guilt that they're not doing anything, even if they're in power. So my answer to how they vote, if they vote, right? If they vote for, how they vote for the green politicians. Um, voting in the Philippines is really based on loyalty and sometimes money. So whoever, Whoever, but in the recent election now, there is actually a change in the pattern because I did a research on this ele election, and people are not just voting for for money; they are voting for um, if you're kind enough, if you're an approachable politicians that people can go to when they they have problems. That's mostly the their. Um, how do you call that their basis of voting, voting a politician? So, and I think the other question was like, are there any uh, NGOs or something who work, uh, identify uh, politicians who are more in favor of the climate? Okay. In Japan, Mar Marion, do you know anything about this one? Or? I just wondered, I, you know, I could imagine that uh, 
uh, NGOs as such as 350 or so are working on this, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, there are groups like 350 Japan who, not so much politicians, but they, um, they're focused on persuading companies to divest from divest. fossil fuels. And they will give you information about banks and that is a very big thing. I think, personally, I think in Japan we need much more dialogue with not in individual politicians, yes, if, if it's where you live, but parties in general. I think this whole in, um, climate crisis movement needs to get together and talk to each political party and really put pressure and start having more petitions, people signing, and really showing the opinions of the people as you know, as we spread this message more because something's got to change. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there more questions? Otherwise, okay. We have this space until 9 p.m., so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you very much for this evening. And uh, actually, I just wanted to share and then for what I'm doing. And then, um, because um, my daughter is starting the uh, um, zero waste project. She sits down next to me. And then uh, we, she grew up in a British environment. And um, I often go to Scotland and, then, um, and staying with her in this summer. But um, in Britain, uh, the, this a few years changes so much and no plastic we at all in a shop and always we have to buy and then biodegradable is it already provided from government and we did, after that I came back to Tokyo shocked <laughs> more 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 plastic so really really shocked and angry so I just started I, I don't like Twitter so um, the other day I just read Twitter is just a stupid things all over there. So I don't really follow the rumor as well. So I just really um, kind of influenced from my daughter and really realized, uh, oh, it is terrible. And they become a very, very strange woman in the shop. Every each shop, if I go, always complain at the shop. Mm -hmm. uh, just facing to the shop owner or manager, excuse me, it's not to you. However, could you please tell your company my feedback? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. they have to listen. And then, OK, OK, oh, hi, something like that. And then, oh, do you understand? Once or twice, I had an argument with the young guys. You know what they said? Oh, this is Japan. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was shocked, really, really shocked. Yeah, yeah. And then. Japan, Japan is really behind. We have to do, somebody have to do that. I'm very sorry, I'm maybe stranger, but uh, strange, but like uh, it, it, we really we have to do. And, and then just uh, I suggested to the shop, um, two shops, actually convenience stores just belonging to company. So I didn't really expect it. they changed something. But I found out depends on the shop as well. So then two shops has changed a little bit. What the change is, I told them, could you please stop just to put in everything in a plastic bag before we paid it? So then all my friend foreigners cannot say no thank you. Before say no thank you, already put everything. Yeah, Here you yeah, go, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. And oh, 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 what can I say? Okay, thank you. So, so I know my colleagues didn't like it. And then, okay, I can do something. Could you please just ask us don't put the plastic uh, spoon or something. Just be, when we are, you know, uh, the checking the uh, the money, and then two shops stopped now. They said, uh, do you, "Would you like to plastic bag?" And oh, thank you very much. You changed. So very very small things I'm doing, but I thought very important to act something, and maybe one day they would change. I just. Uh, yeah, and then I'm thinking to do the meetup, uh, something, and then bring it to the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan. 2020, next year, oh, Tokyo Olympic, everyone is like this, but I, I'm sure m many people will disappoint. <laughs>
from abroad come here. So, yes. Do you want to respond or comment? Well, it happened to me a lot of times <laughs> while here in Tokyo. Just, I have this echo bag with me always, but even if I have the echo bag, they would still put it, that in a transparent plastic before they put that in my echo bag. <laughs> so like, so hard, but I, th I, I thank you, and I wish there were more people like you who are this strong enough to tell the cashier not to do it again because you know even if you're like not you don't like the plastic if people if they already put that in your they put the, your things in a plastic but you just will you will not just you will be shocked and they just comment and bring that plastic back and also there is one thing i've observed also if they they serve with plastic um, spoon and fork, but if you don't use them, they just throw it away, even if you don't use them. So you know the, there is like these companies, these companies must change because even in our individual level, if we don't use that, they will still manufacture more and more and more and just and just like give that to us for free and that's for free and people just use it because hustle free and it's convenience convenient so see that is really important there is really an importance in changing the laws of these companies who would change their business practices thank you thank you uh, I really appreciate you bringing this to our university it's such an important issue and I think you're just really courageous in doing this, and I encourage you to continue. Um, Marinelle has had a very long week. I think she's here for eight days and has an event almost every day. I also want to thank Bjorn for bringing this to us and co-sponsoring through Amnesty International.